Hebrews chapter 9, the first 10 verses. It will be on the screen. It's also on that insert in your bulletin. And it is still in your Bible too. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 to 10. I think it would be good to stand to honor God's word as I read it. Hebrews chapter 9. <clears throat> now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the Most Holy Place, <clears throat> which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the same, excuse me, and the stone tablets of the Covenant. Above the Ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. <clears throat> but only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people, the, the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed, as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drinks and various ceremonial washings. External regulations applying until the time of the new order. This is the word of the Lord. Let's bow in prayer now. Lord, we thank you for the way you gave rich and deep symbols to your people to help them understand and to help us understand uh, who Jesus, our Savior, is. What it means that he is our great high priest, our perfect sacrifice, the one who has taken away our sin so that we can come into the very holy of holies. We can come into your presence even now in prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you speak to us and teach us through your word. And as we stand in your presence now, we come before you to, to listen and to hear and to receive what you have to give us from the word of God. As we pray now in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Beware. Danger ahead. I've come to warn you about Christmas decorations. This time of year we may discover there's a lot more to these decorations than originally meets the eye. Some things that may be a bit of a surprise to us. You know, I want to start with a story. Now, this is a true story, even though uh, it sounds a little far-fetched. I, I can hardly believe it, but I have it from a reliable source. This actually happened uh, back in the 80s. We're going to talk about a, a young, brand-new pastor and his wife that had just finished seminary. They were waiting for their first assignment, and then the phone rang. This was the phone call they were waiting for from the uh, district office about their first assignment. And they were excited and just a little bit anxious, a little bit filled with anxiety. They learned that their first assignment was going to be to reopen a church that had been closed for some time in Brooklyn, New York. Well, when they arrived at the church, their hearts kind of sank because this place had been closed for a long time. It had fallen into disrepair. It was really kind of run down. And so they set a goal that they were going to have everything fixed up in time for a Christmas Eve service. And they set to work repairing pews, filling in plaster holes, painting. And by December 18th, they were ahead of schedule. It looked like everything was going to be ready in time. 
And then beginning December 19th, there was a horrendous torrential downpour of a, of a storm that went on for two days in New York City. After it was over, the young pastor went to uh, check out the site and he found out there was tremendous water damage. Uh, the, the roof had leaked and, and uh, there was this whole section of wall that had fallen off, the plaster had fallen off right behind the pulpit. Well, he did his best to clean up the mess on the floor, but under a huge cloud of discouragement, he concluded the only thing they could do was postpone the Christmas Eve service. As he drove back to their apartment, he uh, passed a sign. Here's a charity a flea market going on. And so he stopped and he went in and he saw this beautiful tablecloth that had a, a cross embroidered right on the middle of it. And he noticed it was about the same size as that hole in the wall behind the pulpit. I wonder, could this be God's providence to take care of the whole situation? So he bought it and turned around and went back to the church. And uh, as he looked out his office window, he noticed that the, a snowstorm had begun now in, in New York City. And he saw an older woman who had just missed her bus. She was trying to catch the bus and she missed it. And uh, in the spirit of the season, he invited her in to the warm church building to wait. It was going to be another 45 minutes before that bus would come again. <laughs> Same thing, first service. It's supposed to be a blank screen now, Bob. <laughs> We're getting ahead of our story there, but that's okay, Bob. I love Bob, and we work together. I don't know what I'd do without Bob back there. Uh, but uh, So the lady is, is in the, uh, sitting in a pew, just kind of thumbing through a hymnal, and he's up there trying to put this, this um, uh, thing on the wall and tack it up over the hole, and it fits. It's perfect. You can't believe how beautiful it looks in this, in this scene. And uh, then he notices that the woman is coming up the center aisle, and her face is white. She said, where did you get that tablecloth? Well, he explained the story. She said, would you just look in the corner and see if you see the initials E-B-G? And he did, well, yeah. She said, I made that tablecloth. And then she explained her story. Uh, years earlier, uh, she and her husband had been quite well-to-do in the land of Austria. But when the Nazis, <laughs> when the Nazis came in, There they are. <laughs> when the Nazis came in, uh, uh, he, he said, you know, they're coming. And he sent her off to flee ahead of time. He said, I've got a few things to take care of. And I will join you as soon as I can. And she said, I, I didn't get away. They arrested me, sent me to prison. And I never again saw my husband or my home in Austria. Well, the pastor just insisted that she take back the tablecloth. And... and uh, she said no. She graciously said no. You keep it. This is, this is going to serve the Lord here in this place. And uh, so three days later, Christmas Eve, the service went off wonderfully. Even better than they imagined. People came in from the neighborhood to see the new church that had been reopened. And, and uh, the place was almost full. The singing was spirited. And the young pastor was just thinking things are off to a good start. A lot of the people said they were going to come back. Uh, and as people began to drift out, there was one man he noticed seated on the front. And then everybody was gone, and this older gentleman was seated right on the front row. And he was just staring. And finally said, Pastor, where did you get that tablecloth? Oh, you know what's coming, right? Where did you get that tablecloth? And uh, he said, well, I bought it at a, you know, a flea market. And he said, you know... There can't be two tablecloths in the whole world like that. That's, that's a tablecloth my wife made. And he explained that, you know, the Nazis had come and he sent her off ahead of time and he never got out. They sent him to a concentration camp. He spent the war there. He says, I haven't seen my wife for 35 years. The pastor said, could I take you for a little ride? And uh, so the pastor headed over to Staten Island where he had taken, I, I forgot that part of the story, he had taken the, the woman earlier because uh, she was only in Brooklyn to do some house cleaning. So he, he had taken her back home rather than make her wait for a bus. So he went to this same apartment that he had just taken the woman to a few days earlier, helped the older man up three flights of stairs, 
knocked on the door and saw the most wonderful Christmas reunion you could ever imagine. 35 years. True story. Now why am I telling you the story? Well, for a couple of reasons. First, just to encourage you with the mysterious and wonderful way that God works in our lives. God's grace is at work in all of our lives in the short run and sometimes in the very, very long run. And I want you to be looking for that and thanking God for it across the Christmas season and, and anticipate the kiss of God's grace in so many ways in our lives. But secondly, <clears throat> this story about the makeshift wall hanging that the pastor created is to help us think about the decorations we use and that very often they have a much deeper meaning than we realize. A much deeper meaning in the decorations of Christmas. These are symbols of our faith. They remind us what Christmas is about and our heritage as God's people. They call attention to the greatest gift of all. Our Christmas trees, our tree ornaments, the advent wreath, the candles, the holly, the ivy, they all have a story to tell. God uses visual decorations. God uses visual decorations. <clears throat> visual aids, decorations, sacred symbols have been central to our worship from the very beginning. Stop and think about it. You know, any time after a storm you see a rainbow. I mean, how can you not think about Noah and God's promise to never again destroy the earth with a flood? In Exodus, God said, I want you to put blood on the doorpost as a symbol of how I'm going to protect you from the plague that comes on the Egyptians. Now God didn't have to do it that way. He could have just protected them. But he said, I want a visual symbol of that protection. Later uh, in the book of Joshua, he had to make a stack of stones on the west bank of the Jordan River. Why? Well, he wanted them to remember through all the generations to come how God had delivered them miraculously out of Egypt and brought them over the Jordan River into uh, into the promised land. Both the tabernacle and the temple of the Old Testament, they were elaborately decorated, symbolizing the glory of God. There were precious metals and semi-precious stones to decorate and to indicate the, the glorious wealth of God's worth. In the New Testament, we see the symbols of the cup and the bread. They stand for an eternal feast, but at the same time they also stand for the cross where Jesus gave his life to qualify us to take part in that feast. I hope you're trusting in Christ as your Savior so that you can be a part of that great eternal feast. As we track the early centuries of the Christian church, other symbols celebrated the meaningful truths. Uh, a cross, a fish, a lamb, a basin, and a towel. Our scripture reading from Hebrews 9 takes us back to the Old Testament, a peek at some of the symbolic visual aids that God had appointed. What was inside the tabernacle? Hebrews 9 said a lampstand, a special table, a loaf of consecrated bread, an altar of incense, and of course the Ark of the Covenant. You know about the Ark of the Covenant, that highly prized box of decorations. Memory joggers, symbols of God's direct work in the life of his people. There was a jar of manna. That was the food that God used to feed the children of Israel out in the wilderness for 40 years. To try to remind this amnesia prone congregation of God's faithful provision. He wanted the Israelites to remember. Aaron's staff that had miraculously sprouted leaves called to mind God's ability to validate the ones that he chooses as leaders. The two stone tablets engraved with the covenant and the commandments of God. The Ark of the Covenant represented the very presence of God. Where the ark was, God was. God knows that we're humans, that we need tangible indicators to remember that he's with us. And if you remember the remaining verses of Hebrews chapter 9, it becomes clear that all of this, this ceremonial structure was temporary. It was a shadow. It was not enough. It was not sufficient to meet the deepest needs of uh, the human heart and soul. And these verses help us understand how Jesus was the one that fulfilled all of those symbols. He was our high priest. And yet at the same time, he was a high priest who did not offer 
bulls and goats, he offered himself. He was the sacrifice as well as the high priest. But God, you know, is not done with the power of symbolism. Visual imagery is still a part of our worship and our celebration. God uses visual decoration. God uses seasonal decoration. Seasonal decoration. Now you know by now that the fellowship is entering into a, a special time of, of reflection and, and focused worship. Next Sunday is the beginning of the Advent season. I plan to lead us through the month of December with a series of messages that will help us stay focused on Christ throughout the Christmas season. Now that's not an easy assignment, is it? Christmas becomes really chaotic and cluttered with all the commercialism and the calendar demands and unrealistic expectations. Some of us are just already worn out just thinking about it. And it's all too easy to miss the simple joy of celebrating the meaning of Christ's birth. The theme of this Advent series, you've already heard it this morning, seasoning the season. Now what does that mean? We have this season, but we want to add seasoning to it. Like you add seasoning to certain foods that you have in order to bring out the flavor, to bring out the flavor of that food. We want to bring out the flavor of Christ who's, who's there in a lot of these traditions, but he's gotten buried. And we want to bring out that flavor of Christ. Each week we're going to explore how we can approach some of our popular holiday routines like gift giving and sending cards and decorating the place and family gatherings, church services, uh, opening presents, making resolutions. Each of these routines, how can we pursue them with an eye on Jesus? Does that sound interesting? I think it's going to be very interesting. Now, I want you to think about life generally. There are many things we take for granted in life that have a deeper meaning. For instance, you may use nursery rhymes with your children when they're little. Do you realize that the nursery rhymes were originally disguised political statements? In certain regimes of old Europe, it was very dangerous to say something politically incorrect. It could cost you your life. So these rhymes were actually the political cartoons of their day. Humpty Dumpty has nothing at all to do with an egg. That's in the picture, it's not in the words. It's actually about a battle in the English Civil War. Mary Quite Contrary is Mary Queen of Scots. Little Boy Blue is Cardinal Wolsey. Ring Around the Rosie. I don't know what happened to our things here, but there was a picture of Ring Around the Rosie. That was about the Black Death. And Jack and Jill, that's about King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette meeting the guillotine, where she came tumbling after, as you recall. As I said at the outset today, our Christmas customs are more Christian than you might think. For instance, what about that song, The Twelve Days of Christmas? Is that just a silly nonsense song? Did you know that it was originally created as a tool to instruct young people about the Christian faith? There was an era in one country of Europe when a branch of Christianity faced severe discrimination. For about 250 years, those underground believers had to find ways to pass on their beliefs. And this is an example of how they did it. The song goes, on the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. My true love is God. And the me who's receiving these gifts is the Christian believer. What did he give? The partridge in a pear tree is Jesus who died on a tree as a gift from God. The two turtle doves are the two testaments, the Old and New Testament, another gift from God. The three French hens are faith, hope, and love, three gifts of the Holy Spirit that abide. The four calling birds are the four gospels that sing the song of salvation through Jesus Christ. The five golden rings are the five first books of the Bible. We call them the books of Moses, where we have the covenant as symbolized today in a ring. The six geese alane, six days of creation, seven swans of swimming, seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. The eight, uh, eight maids of milking are the beatitudes. The nine ladies dancing are the nine gifts, or excuse me, the ninefold fruit of the Spirit. The ten lords of leaping are the ten commandments. The eleven pipers piping are the eleven faithful disciples. And the twelve drummers drumming are the twelve points of the Apostles' Creed. Who would have thought? Next time you hear 
the 12 days of Christmas playing in the background in the department store or some very non-religious setting, just remember, this is about Christ. And remember at that point to pray for our Christian brothers and sisters who are facing persecution in some lands today. You can use a popular song to refresh, refresh the flavor of Christmas in your own walk. Now how would you like to do that every day of the Christmas season? This little uh, advent calendar that we have back there in the Family Activity Center is a gold mine of doing that. It's interactive. You're not going to have a spiritually meaningful holiday just by being passive. So we've got this advent calendar. It's available one to a household today. And by the way, if you're a visitor today, please, we want you to take one. Uh, we want that to be our, our gift to you as a visitor in our service. Um, some of you are going to want more than one and uh, you want to give them away as gifts to your friends or kids or whatever. Um, one to a family is free uh, and beyond that you'll, you'll need to purchase them. They're just $3 but uh, we don't, as you know, sell anything on Sunday so you have to call during the week if you want to purchase extra ones. We want to make sure everybody has one to a family in our church and then I think we'll have some extras which uh, we'll be able to take your order for. These calendars, they, they have a, a Christ focus every day. Just take a few minutes at supper time or at the evening, at bedtime, you and the family together. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, fun uh, practical activities that you can carry out and they're all focused on the truth of the message that I preached the Sunday before. And we've tried to, it, it's set up in a very versatile way so if you've got a family full of little children it'll work. Or if you're a single adult living by yourself, it'll work. There's different tracks on this to, to run on. Seasoning the season, Advent calendars. Uh, there are questions to ask around the dinner table related to each Sunday morning's message. That Sunday, uh, the Sunday date, you have some questions to discuss if you want to do that. And so it starts this Friday. This Friday is when you turn to page 15 and start on your Advent calendar. You say 15, well there are 14 pages you need to read first. <laughs> a little bit of introduction on how to use it, including what will be mystery to, it was for me for a while. It goes through all the pages one way and then you flip it around and the second half of the Advent is on the other side. If you don't get that, these two sides are going to get you really mixed up. So you just follow the page numbers. Oh wow, look at that. It's even got a little stand so you can set it right up on your coffee table. Look at that. Who would have thought? I hope each of you are going to take time to make an Advent wreath this week. And there are some instructions on page 12 on how to make an Advent wreath. I think there's really great benefits when a family does this together. Uh, but you want to keep it simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, this is, uh, my wife got this this week so we can make ours. She's going to put some pine branches on it. And that was a dollar and a half at AC Moore. She knows how to get the bargains. Uh, four little candle holders, a place to... But you know, whether you use styrofoam or, or pine branches or just have a plate with four candles on it, it's still an advent wreath. Don't make this overly complicated. Of course, you want to make sure your creativity doesn't go wild. <laughs> Even if that does reduce your carbon footprint. <clears throat> The Advent wreath gives a wonderful way to involve your children. Year to year, this can be building indelible memories about the meaning of Christmas. Now, as we're kind of easing into Advent, I want to look at some of the Christmas decorations this morning. When you crawl up in your attic or down, maneuver among all those boxes down in the basement, you find that trunk that's full of tinsel and wreaths and ornaments and lights and so on. Uh, are you aware of the significance some of those decorations have? We're going to consider just for a few moments how we can grace our homes with more than just decorations. Maybe you've got a question whether Christians should even take part in some of these things that come from our culture. Should we be dressing up our homes with holiday fare? Now, I love what Jack Hayford has to say about the appropriateness of decking the halls of our homes with the with the trappings of the season. He has a wonderful little book called Come and Behold Him, An Invitation to Chris Christmas worship. And he writes, quote, as a guide to your decoration, I offer a few observations. First, be assured that it is righteous. It is righteous. I mean, decoration of a house at Christmas is neither a surrender to pagan tradition, nor is it a capitulation to commercialism. 
Listen, if God commissioned angels to roll back the night and fill, fill it with blazing light, if God provided a celestial choir to serenade a few startled shepherds, if God graced the heavens with a miracle star, if he arranged a memorable entry point like a feeding trough in a stable, if God went to all that trouble to open our eyes to his entry to the world, then, he says, we don't need to apologize for festooning our home with a few seasonal reminders, end quote. Hayford just goes on to point out how uh, this fits in with the whole history of visual artistry, whether among the ancient Old Testament people of God or the Christian church. You ever thought about the old Gothic cathedrals of Europe or our own country? Those stone carvings and vaulted grandeur and the stained glass windows, they create a Christmas-like brilliance that is never put away <clears throat> on New Year's Day. In fact, what's really happened is that the secular culture has borrowed the concept of celebration from the church. It's not vice versa. Why don't you think about Christmas window displays in the major department stores. Now, I think that's a little passe now, but when I was a kid, we couldn't wait to go down and see the animated windows in the downtown stores. Where did that come from? The originator was a man named Frank Baum. Does that name sound familiar? Frank Baum is the creator of The Wizard of Oz. But well before he became a popular writer, he worked in merchandising. And at the beginning of the 20th century, he helped many downtown department stores discover the power of window displays. These were in the days before movies and before television. And department store windows represented a source of entertainment and novelty. Based on what Baum knew and what others knew about the church, they seized on the idea of glass <clears throat> and lights and color to create memorable experiences and also to help with department store receipts with cash. But the bottom line is not just the, the department store sales. The bottom line is the fact of dressing up department stores or even dressing up our homes is grounded in what God had set in motion centuries earlier. For human beings to catch the glory of mystery, they need visual representations. So let's consider a few of the more common decorations, like the Christmas tree. That's a good place to start. Cutting and displaying an evergreen tree is a custom that goes back for centuries. A green tree that never loses its leaves or its needles like the other trees do, that's a symbol of eternal life. And because Jesus came into our world to secure an eternal salvation, give us the gift of everlasting life, that symbol seems appropriate to embrace at Christmas time. I hope you have stepped into that eternal life that Jesus gives as a free gift. Long ago, the Christmas tree was decorated with white candles, obviously, before the days of fire codes and fire marshals. We don't place candles on our trees today, do we? But it still represents the same thing when we put the lights on. This is about Jesus, the light of the world. Do you think your non-Christian neighbors know that? Probably not. And yet even they will lavish lights on their trees. They outline the exterior of their homes with lights. Isn't it amazing? Our neighbors, our neighborhoods are visual fairylands of light this time of year. Of course, sometimes the messages are not that warm. Sometimes the messages are not that warm. That's right. Okay. <laughs> but the, the glow of Christmas lights is to give glory to the one who came into our darkness of sin so that God's loving plan for our lives could shine forth to translate us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Now what about the decorations on your trees? In many churches the decorations are not spun glass baubles or, or plastic balls. They are handmade chrismans. A chrisman is a fabric or wooden symbol of the Christian faith. Years ago our church in Akron where Cheryl and I lived for 10 years, started raising our family. We had a tree at the center of our foyer that had this breathtaking display of delicately crocheted and tatted needlework. I wish I had a picture of that today, but it's no longer. We're, we're, we need to go back a slide, Bob. I'm not sure. Let's go back to the Chrismans. There we go. 
Um, they, they'd been made by some of the senior women in, in that church. Now, obviously, a tree that's decorated with an alpha and omega or a cross will create a Christ-centered atmosphere in the room. Are your decorations spiritual? Or maybe not so much? Even if it took you years to collect the full Mickey Mouse collection, it's not too late to set a new course. Now, I'm not saying everything has to be a religious symbol. There's that collection of babies' first Christmas ornaments. There's some homemade ornaments my wife painted years ago for each child. Every ornament has a meaning. Some of, them, some of our ornaments remember special family events. They're a visual history of our family. Each one calls to mind a season of ministry or a season of our life. Not overtly spiritual, but deeply sacred. When we hang items on a tree, it's, it's like the children of Israel standing by the memorial stones recalling God's past blessings. One family tells of using an eight-inch nail hanging on a red ribbon. By the way, you don't have to spend $5.99 at the bookstore to do that. You can just get a nail. But uh, they hang that ornament first, deep inside the tree. And that calls to mind the reason why Christ was born, to, dry, to die on, a, on another tree for our sins. Or another ornament added by a family was a little plastic baby Jesus from an incomplete nativity set they found in a thrift, thrift store. But they place this baby Jesus in a little box and they write on the box the first gift of Christmas with love from God. And they put that box right at the base of the tree and on Christmas morning that's always the first gift they open to help put into perspective all the other gifts. Your Advent wreath, that's symbolic as well. It's a circle indicating that uh, God's love has no beginning or end. If you use holly sprigs, they have an ancient story too. They're incorporated into Christian services because of the, you know, the, the prickly leaves that connote the crown of thorns, the red berries that suggest Jesus' sin-cleansing blood. Back to Jack Hayford's book. He talks about sanctifying our decorations. What he means is, quote, Present your decorating and decorations to the Lord as a tribute to him. Before you decorate, pray. While you're decorating, worship. After you decorate, give thanks. And here's a key verse from Paul. Whatever you do, whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks to God the Father by him. Now that's one worth memorizing for the Christmas season and for any time. Whatever we're doing to do it for the Lord. Makes a lot of sense. As you hang the ornaments on your tree, offer sentence prayers to celebrate God's goodness to you and your family down through the years. Whatever each of these ornaments represent. And go ahead and crank up the volume on the CD player and sing along some of the worshipful Christmas songs as you decorate the house. Make it an act of worship. An act of worship. And then, when everything is in place, walk through each room and acknowledge the Lord's presence with joy in that room. I talked with one family recently who says they've been each year adding a new manger scene and they want to have one in every room in the house. And then Hayford adds one more observation. When you dress up, you usually go out. We're dressing up our homes, but since they are fixed locations, the only alternative is to invite others in. It's a witness to our neighbors to see believers who actually are happy about life. You know, the reputation out there in the world is that Christians are kind of uptight and sour and dour kind of folks, incapable of real gladness. So when your neighbors and your relatives encounter a home that's filled with true happiness, with a lighthearted spirit of fun and a warm, generous welcome, that's disarming. It paints a whole new portrait of the Jesus life. And then Hayford concludes, remember years ago, a country western favorite which featured the lyric, you decorated my life. Well, no, as a matter of fact, Jack, I don't remember that song. <laughs> but I do remember Debbie Boone's number one hit in 77, You Light Up My Life. Some of you are old enough to remember that. Either way, these words could well be sung to Jesus himself. He's given so much. He's brightened our world so grandly. And since he has, our decorations are simply another way of singing with godly gratitude. Now, in case you don't remember either of those songs, let me try another oldie. 
Remember that one tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree? Ah, I see a few of you nodding. You know, that soon translated into yellow ribbons for our soldiers coming home from overseas, which then translated into uh, red ribbons for AIDS and then pink ribbons for uh, breast cancer. But it all started with this yellow ribbon song. It's about a guy who was in prison. Ten year sentence. He wrote his girlfriend. He's about to get out. He says, you know, would you tie a yellow ribbon around the trunk of the tree in front of your house if you still love me, if you still want me? But, you know, he said, if you, if you can't forgive me, if your life has moved on after these ten years, just disregard the request. Don't put anything on the ribbon, on the tree. He says, when, when the bus I'm on goes down the state highway, we're going to pass your house. And if I see the yellow ribbon, I'll get off. If not, I'm just going to keep going. Well, the day came. He's released from prison in this ballad. They're going down the highway. He can't bear to look. What if it's not there? But everybody on the bus knows about it. And they look. And there's not a yellow ribbon on the tree. There's not a single yellow ribbon. There's a hundred of them. There's a hundred of them. And the whole bus cheers. Talk about a, a graphic picture of the forgiveness and love of God. How about it? Can you allow your Christmas tree laden with ribbons and bows and ornaments and tinsel to conjure up images of God's love for you. I hope you can think of the Christmas tree that way. Begin to see these dusty old decorations in a new perspective. God uses visual decoration. He uses seasonal decoration. And I just want to note briefly here at the end that God uses personal decoration. Briefly, but this is the most important. Uh, you, there's an interesting word in Titus chapter 2. It says, demonstrating utter faithfulness so that we may adorn the teaching of God with God our Savior in everything. For the grace of God has appeared with salvation for all people. Adorn? Now let's think of how that word adornment becomes the word, adorn becomes the word adornment. And even ornament. All of these are related. And I'm wondering, have I got this right? Is he talking about ornaments here? So I decided to check out it's only used a few places in the New Testament. It's the Greek word cosmio. And sure enough, in, in Matthew, you build the tombs of the prophets and you decorate the monuments of the righteous. It's the same word, same verb. Or in, in Luke, some of them speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings. But it really gets good in Revelation. Revelation 21, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Does a bride really put on everything to look beautiful when she's going to get married? Okay. And then that, that holy city looks like a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 19. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. Jasper, sapphire, agate, emerald, all down the line. It lists 12 different jewels. Now that's not the, the top of the wall. That's the foundation. That's the dirty part. <laughs> but it says these precious jewels in the foundation. But then notice what it says in verse 14 of the same chapter. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. He's saying that his apostles are these 12 precious stones. Ephesians 2 talks about that. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And then it says of us in 1 Peter 2 that we're a part of this. You are built together into a dwelling place of God. You yourselves are like living stones being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. You see, I'm getting the picture here that this really is talking about adornment. Some of you are using the NIV. I use a different translation for Titus 2 uh, where it says adornment. And in the NIV it says uh, you make the gospel, you make God's truth credible. I don't think that's the right translation. I think what it should say is you make God's truth beautiful. You make it beautiful. And so what this means as we adorn, as our lives, not just the objects we put on the tree, but the way we live adorns the gospel, we're really decorating God's truth. We decorate God's truth. Why do we do that? Well, then it says, for the grace of God has appeared with salvation for all people. The grace of God appearing, that's just another way of saying Christmas. In other words, this really means that the Christian is actually 
A Christmas ornament. That's right. We decorate, we bring forth this truth that God's grace has appeared. God has come. So if our identity is a Christmas ornament, what's the purpose of this? It says that God has appeared to bring salvation to all people. It's not just enough that you experience this salvation, but as you as an ornament to let others know, to see the beauty of his salvation. And, you know, all we've said about what you do with the things you hang on your tree or your wall means nothing if your life is not an ornament that decorates the gospel. And how do we do that? Through faithfulness. Through being faithful. Uh, it's demonstrating utter faithfulness so that they may adorn the teaching of God our Savior. Faithfulness, and if you read through this passage, it's faithfulness in four relationships. Faithfulness to the world. It speaks of repentance. It says we renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. You can't live on both sides. You can't show the glory of God and be stuck in the practices of this world. And repentance is a daily lifestyle for a Christian to turn away from this. But the second part is faithfulness in our walk. Not only the negative, we don't want to just be, I don't do that, but positive. The positive, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. To live before the face of God, coram Deo, to live godly lives. Faithfulness in our wait, and it talks about waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of our Lord, of the glory of, of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. The word advent is from the Latin adventum, which is used in this verse in the Latin Bible. Advent means coming or appearing. In fact, it's used twice here. For the grace of God has appeared. That's Christmas. We're waiting for him to appear. That's the second coming. And our Advent season is about both of these comings. And as we're faithful in the way we live in this world, with a godly walk, but eagerly waiting for his appearing, and then lastly, faithful in our work, it says to be zealous for good works. It's this kind of faithfulness that makes us God's Christmas ornament. God uses Visual decoration, seasonal decoration, personal decoration. Here's our calendar. I hope you're going to use it because this is how we're seasoning. We're working together to season the season with God's, uh, with, a, with Christ's presence in all that we do. To see a lot of the old things we've been doing in new ways. Each week we're going to have instructions on how to practice the essence of Christ's presence as you go about your, your Christmasing. It's a practical way to decorate your own. In fact, for many of you, it's going to become a new coffee table book. One of the books you put on your coffee table when you come around to Christmas time. Let's pray that this whole Advent series will help us to see the fingerprints of Jesus in the various traditions that we examine. Our magnifying glass is going to be worship and preaching and daily reflection as together we season the season to bring out the flavor of Christ in Christmas. Let's stand together for our closing prayer now. After I pray, some of you may want to come to the prayer chapel, the door up here behind the piano. There'll be someone there to pray with you. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. Thank you for all the ways you have given to us to make visible, to remember, to symbolize so that our hearts can be daily refreshed. And I pray that that's going to be true for each of us this Christmas season. That it won't be just a busy, do list, endless activities that crowd out the Lord Jesus Christ. Now go forth as God's Christmas ornament to be faithful day in and day out to reflect his glory and to be his light in the darkness. We pray through Christ. Amen.